as you can imagine guys the title of this video is not something i would say i would not call Cherny an idiot but it's something that uh, and a viewer did and so i will read the comment of this guy and you know when i feature comments on the channel it's primarily the prime reason is of obviously to just clarify points that i made that were not clear to you or in some cases when people just land on the channel and they ask kind of obvious questions it gives me also the opportunity to just give an obvious answer and maybe to guide them a little bit here and there in this jungle of videos because that's what it is a youtube channel is not like a book a book you can open you have a contents table you have an index you have a glossary of terms uh, index of names even and uh, we're writing that book so that will come hopefully this year probably this year finishing the first uh, draft manuscript as we speak still a few weeks works work but um anyways so on the youtube channel the search um the bar doesn't give you always an in and in direction of where to go and where to find the obvious thing and we have playlists and we have you know everything we can do but you cannot just uh, summarize or just bring thousand videos together um and make it uh, into a very appealing overview for some who's just landing here but in some cases people just knowingly make statements that need strong corrections we had recently that of this mr left hound who's obviously a fake account of uh, someone who uh, compared me to einstein one time and the other t the five sentences further i was just a conspiracy theorist so i want to highlight those comments sometimes as well because they you know they give us an opportunity to have like a, a, a clarification in another direction and when people say really idiotic things on purpose and with their full consent you know they that deserves also a little word from me and in this case talking about Karl Czerny it is in particular interest of the, the work that we do and I think also of you because what this guy is going to say is something that you probably hear a lot Karl Czerny is not today enjoying a very high um, esteem. His reputation is not what it used to be in the 19th century. And that's a pity. That's something we should correct. And I see signs that that is still that is slowly like going into the right direction in the sense that um, even Karl Czerny's metronome marks um, of the cello um, sonatas of Beethoven are published, I believe, in Berenreiter or is it Wiener Urtext? I don't know. The comment, uh, the commentary of the uh, the guy who does the introduction doesn't know really what to do with them. So there, in spite of the fact that people are publishing them, also the violin sonatas uh, that people are publishing them, um, makes our case even better. Because yeah, what do you have to say when things are unplayable? Then you have to say the obvious to the reader, right? So, but the pressure on everybody and everything the system so to say to take journey more and more seriously is of course growing but sometimes you have comments like this and i just want to go over that really quickly um it's made by lewis colin colodin i wouldn't do i mean i wouldn't take this comment when whether he was not when he would not be a pianist uh, i checked this channel this, i mean there, the guy is playing on a steinway and uh, i have no judgment to say about whether he's a good or a mediocre pianist it doesn't matter um the, the most striking fact is that he's posing like half naked on this channel i don't know what's missing in his performances uh, to feel the need for posing like that i don't think it's uh, i mean i wouldn't be attracted to the channel anyways when i see a, an avatar like that but that's just besides the question we're going to read i'm going to read the comment here that he left on the carl czerny pedantic destroyer of bach legacy series number one if you haven't seen that's highly recommendable because um we can see the impact of carl czerny's metronome marks for bach uh, in music that is totally outside the scope except Lizitsa then of virtuosity or showcasing like of showing off um, or just playing as fast as possible and there you see a lot of performers that just end up almost there where Czerny and Holbeat is but that's and if you haven't seen that the link is uh, maybe not in the description box but the playlist can be easily found I want to read this and then just comment a little bit on who Karl Czerny actually was. So he starts by saying there is a fallacy of Czerny new beans about rock articulation in new beans about Baroque. Final dot. 
whatever. Everything I may have said is random. It doesn't matter how Beethoven played it because he didn't know about it either. And almost all the performers of his, this list, with exceptions like Leonard, are ignorance about this subject. Go tell that to Mr. Koopman, by the way. Not that I agree. I mean, agree. That's such a strong word with every tempo choice that he had uh, for his Bach cantatas. But uh, Don Koopman is quite knowledgeable in the terms of Baroque performances. I mean, come on. Goldschiff and Turek may play it beautifully, but they never studied how to approach this historically. Schiff even plays a quarterly box cheek as a 6 8. How dare he! Just because he wants to. to. So all of these are fallacy because Beethoven, Chen, and modern performers are no reference. Just to, very quick, that's not. I mean, first of all, when Czerny came to Beethoven, Mr. Half-Naked Louis Colondin might not know that, but uh, his father was told by Beethoven to buy the book of G.P. Bach, his Versuch, three ties. If you don't know what a Versuch is, uh, on keyboard playing, standard work in the 18th century, till deep in the 18th century, 19th century even, Beethoven recommended it. No, Czerny must he had to have it in order to have lessons from Beethoven. So it is a centerpiece in the education that Beethoven gave to Czerny. Also, Beethoven, student, studied with Neve in Bonn, played the World Temperate Clavier and Clavichord. There, so not saying that Neve, second generation Bach, was perfectly like playing like Bach. We had already the gallant style and all, the, all of that, but that Beethoven and this tradition that these people knew, knew nothing about articulation and then, I'm sorry, but <laughs> what's the channel there a little bit? I mean, yeah, I would trust Beethoven a little bit more in this than Louis Collodin. And it's not, a, it's not the purpose of these series of videos. I mean, the impact or you would say the implication of what Czerny gives us mentioned marks for uh, Bach, it's up to interpretation. Also, if you go to his edition, it's there behind me, uh, one of the books. Um, it's the Walter Pritik Clavier, I think that's open. So if you go there and see all the articulation marks, the fingerings, they are there for the pianoforte, obviously. And the additional performance remarks that he makes are an updated performance practice, like saying this is how Bach was played in that time. And it's probably very close to Beethoven on the piano for the Reno. No, that. that's 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 interesting. That's fascinating. That's part of the research. But the point of this series of videos is not to prove that Beethoven was a Bach player or that Schiffer, that all these people studied how to play Bach. Um, by the way, that's if, if, if you are not in this, if you're not in preparing now the World Temperate Clavier, there are so many things that are you, we will never find a concrete, definitive answer, even not with the book of C.P. Bach next to it. Um, then you don't know what you're talking about. It's a very complex matter. The, but the only purpose of this series of videos with Czerny Bach is to, as I said at the beginning, when people are not playing, when musicians are not aiming for the fastest performance, when they're not aiming to reach like this virtual metronome mark that they know they can never reach and maybe even not think about it consciously, but it's, it's there, you know, when people are not thinking about that, then even people or musicians like Tom Koopman who have the tendency to play very fast, play in journey whole beat range. And that's strange. And also when you update or you digitally up, um, speed up those performances to single beat, which in, in, in 10 or 11 cases is, is necessary because even Lizitza doesn't uh, come there, in spite of the fact that she says that she aims for the highest tempo that she, tempo that she can reach. Well, then people have a shock because suddenly what appears to be a kind of normal speed of expectation in Beethoven is like, this is not possible. And it's the same journey, it's the same metronome mark, it's the same notation. So that's, the, of course, the meaning of that of that series. But I continue. Uh, there it comes. I vote Czerny to be an idiot. He could not play Chopin's Opus 10, number one. Her, I mean, Czerny was a guy. His pedagogical works are a disaster. It teaches forte piano, not pianoforte, whatever. I mean, people used that both terms in the 19th century. It's 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 something of our time to make a distinction between forte piano and pianoforte. It's it's non-existent. And as a composer, he never came close to 50% of what Beethoven was. Well, if if that's your benchmark, then the majority of composers fall off the table. Who can who can stand in the shadow of Beethoven? For the purpose of teaching piano, much better than Bergmüller of Gobart's. Yeah, I mean. 
no comment on that i think those who really teach the sonority of the new instrument what would we say of jenny if he was not beethoven's pupil nor list teacher well news for you he was beethoven's student and he was uh, a list teacher what would we say of beethoven when he didn't compose the ninth symphonies when he didn't compose the sonatas when he didn't compose any of his music we probably would never heard of the guy well that's correct but he did compose all of that music as Czerny is was the student of Beethoven for several years by the way and he was the teacher of Liszt and I would completely ignore him yeah but you can you can rip anybody everybody of all of his qualities and achievements and yeah then nothing would be left of course uh, what would what would we know of J.S. Bach if he never composed music I can't trust a single page he wrote. Well, that's your problem. Uh, they are all based on the fallacy of how Beethoven used to do it. History is full of mediocre people being admired. That's an interesting statement. I would love to see the list. I'm not saying there is no, no, no uh, mediocre person that still is admired today. But yeah, I, I have not the impression that Czerny is a person that got men much admiration and i would say honestly and his compositions maybe doesn't deserve that i don't know who's who knows all of the music that Czerny has composed but then we continue it's all a political decision of who gets the fame Czerny was very lucky to be in the right place in the correct time no more than this well i guess all of my viewers all of you have um, you don't need me to see that this is just complete a complete idiotic comment that doesn't hold any water i mean just knowing a few facts but that's the reason why i make a video anyway just a few facts if people say this to you i mean you just have to give the resume of journey imagine that louis colladin half naked would sit there behind the desk as a principal as a director of a conservatory in need of a piano forte teacher or forte piano teacher or whatever and Czerny knocks on the door and he gives his resume and he would be rejected because Mr. Colodin apparently uh, for him it's not enough that Czerny was uh, for a few years Beethoven student that he was one of his few lifelong friends that Beethoven referred to Czerny all the time when he got requests for teaching. That Czerny, by the way, he was teaching, he taught for 40 years, eight hours a day. When you are that bad of a teacher, I would guess you cannot find the pupils for 40 years, eight hours a day. He didn't even get time to marry. He literally says it in his autobiography. I, I'm, I was too busy. I was too busy. I was teaching for eight hours a day, and in my spare time, I was composing or writing. And he did write a lot of things. So Mr. Colladin would be given like a list of almost uh, 800 and so many opus numbers. But if you see the opus numbers that he wrote, like, for instance, the Grados at Parnassum, two books, I don't know how many, um, but more than 20, maybe even 30, if not 40 pieces of which many preludes and fugues and the fugues are far from bad eh? there are i recorded some of my on my channel on clavichord they're very interesting pieces and so you will end up in in over way over a thousand compositions by the way on the resume would be franz liszt saying if you see Czerny's first sonata i believe it's opus seven you immediately see words of list what kind of great composer we lost in the person of Czerny, who composed just too much. who didn't have the patience to wait for a composition to be... I mean, all of that. He was a teacher of Karl, Karl von Beethoven, Beethoven's uh, nephew. He was, when Beethoven really needed a, a high standard transcription of any of his important work, it was Czerny who made that. And he made that in a time that is just amazing. If you see only the transcriptions that he made, you know another person who was very good at this? Franz Liszt and guess who was Franz Liszt's teacher when Czerny was asked how do you do that he said guess who was my teacher Beethoven I'm, so, I'm just saying like guys in these days and I know I mean Louis Collodin he is just someone who doesn't know anything about it just is frustrated by seeing a channel that gives uh, another view on metronome marks it kills his gods like there goes the list there goes by the way Thalberg was also a student of, of Czerny Czerny solely actually created the entire 19th century almost who was visiting Czerny before he went to Paris uh, Frédéric Chopin I mean, also the remark, Czerny was not able to play Opus 10 number one. I mean, what's that for a remark? Have you ever seen the etudes of Czerny? 
That's the mystery about him. He was aware of a history and musical performances. That he lived on the edge, on the bridge, like it was disappearing. And in partly, in part, he kept the tradition by just giving so many metronome marks, by writing a piano forte school. Have you ever read the forte piano school of Czerny? It's unbelievable. It's maybe one of the best, if not the most complete piano forte schools or keyboard schools in general ever written. We should pay more attention to Czerny. And the final point is, if you disregard him as a musician, we will never know what he was worth. I, we only know that um, he gave many of the premieres of Beethoven's Sonata. The Hammerklavier Sonata was premiered by Czerny after a few weeks of practice. So, so bad, so terrible the guy couldn't have been. Um, we have the famous letter of Beethoven where he really apologized for being outraged after a concert because Czerny added some ornaments to his music. That's an important letter, should bring that on the channel. We all said like Beethoven would be fine with everything. No, his favorite pu pupil in public, he was scolded like very hard because he added some elements that were not in the score. It was only some embellishments and some not respecting of, of dynamics. I mean, it's unbelievable. What a picture we have of that time. But Czerny and if of all, okay, I'm not saying in the series that we should go to Czerny to learn how Bach is supposed to play it, but is the source much closer to Bach than Mr. Kolodin is? Huh? We should study, we should learn, we should recontextualize, we should reposition Czerny in the context of its time. And when he writes, I'm writing the time of the fugues as I remember Beethoven played, well, then we are close to Beethoven. We can say that Czerny was, Czerny was obviously lying. Like everything. Yeah, I mean, but then we can we can only trust the sources of the 19th century where we can actually pick some sentences here and there that, that, that serves our cause. I mean, that's not how research works. You have no judgment over sources until you can prove at the very, very end, after trying everything, that the source is not worthy of being used in like finding an historical truth of correct or re reconstruct something. Only then you cannot upfront say that's all nonsense, that's all nonsense, because it doesn't fit my taste, it doesn't fit my conviction. That's not how research works. And so when Czerny writes, these tempi are how I remember Beethoven play, then we should take this very seriously. Why would he lie about that? Why would he? Was, if anything, Beethoven was for Czerny like, can you imagine how when, when Beethoven died in 1827, he didn't metronomize his sonatas except the Hammerklavier sonata. Be also, the reason for that was because it, 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 it was partly some movements were um, at the end in, in general. It was given to, Franz, to, to Ferdinand Ries, his student, and to other people in London who, who gave him his, uh, the famous uh, Broadwood pianoforte. So in, for reasons of people there to play it in the correct tempo, Beethoven gave metronome marks. But for the, all, the, all the rest of the sonatas, he never metronome marks. Guess who started doing that right after Beethoven's death in 1828 in the Haslinger edition? If you find them on the internet, uh, I don't know if there are on MSLP, I have them at home, first editions uh, given by Lorenz Guardian, obviously, but those metronome marks are by Czerny's hand, right after Beethoven's death. I'm not saying that they had an agreement to doing that, but it wouldn't surprise me. He was so close to the master that everything he wrote is very important to study. So in other words, if we come closer to Beethoven in, in, in to Czerny's in, uh, edition, I, maybe not the fingerings, maybe yes, maybe not the articulation, maybe yes, we don't know, I don't know, that's, that's the fascinating thing of doing research. But you have to open your mind for that to happen if you just condemn Czerny. And by the way, that's, this is a very strong statement, but many people do that today. Who is, who is taking their guy seriously in terms of playing? I was recently uh, giving a concert and there was like a very, very nice lady. She's, she's almost 90 harpsichord player. I know her. I mean, uh, and we were talking about this and I mentioned Karol Czerny and, and then Bach and, and she was like horrified. Like, you, you're not talking you're not using Bach and Czerny in the same sentence, right? His editions, really? I burned them all? Like, she didn't say that, but it was quite kind of the answer. I mean, if you have that, I can understand that because it's how we 
how we grow up. I mean, journey, bah, really? That's crazy. Don't say, go to a harpsichord player and say, like, I, I think this journey and Tempe are interesting uh, to understand Bach. I mean, he will just, he will just not even say anything to you. I mean, it's like, really? But it is interesting. It is more than interesting. But it's difficult. It's not black and white. You have to position that source. You have to say, okay, imagine that this was how Beethoven played. And then maybe there is some echoes of how he learned the piece to be played by Neve. Yes or no? That's already a very difficult question. But you won't get much closer to Beethoven Bach performances than through Czerny. And when you're there, you as well can take a few steps more and say, what can we learn if we zoom out? What other sources do we have in regard of tempo? Kotlop Tuk, for instance, give a very, abs very, very absolute tempo indication, which is uh, which is uh, interesting. I come back to that. It's 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 hardly ever mentioned, and there are some really strange things happening around that as well. Where, for instance, I mean, I'm not digressing there with Clive Brown, given his book, like a huge uh, effort to say, like we don't we don't have really hard. Um, tempo indications of the 18th century quants maybe, but um, then he comes to Turk and the sentences where Turk, Turk does that is completely omitting those, like unbelievable. The most important thing perhaps in his entire book, well, yeah, his entire book is important. But anyways, you have to contextualize that with that source. Then you go back to quants eventually, you have the tempo ordinario with which we are informed, and then you combine all the puzzle pieces. In cases of the inventions in whole beat, I would say, it's not too slow in whole beat, eh? It's even on the fast side. That's also the reaction I get from many people. A Chinese whole beat is not so slow in general for the invention. Symphonias is another thing. They're a little bit slower, more, I mean, in line. And long story short, we better look at them a little bit more serious. But again, that's not the purpose of the series. But I want you to understand that Karl Czerny is one of the major players in historical performance reconstruction practice. And although more people than you'd think are taking him seriously, on a general scene, in general, he deserves way more credit. And the reason, I think, but that's the final point here, and that's just speculation, but the reason that so few people are standing up and saying, Karl Czerny, we take him seriously, his editions, his metronome marks, everything, his pianoforte school, not only to study Beethoven, the context of his time, and maybe earlier music, the reason that people don't do that is because he has been destroyed in the 20th century. And so whenever someone um, comes with Czerny, I remember, you will not find it anymore because it's it's from from previous century. That's how old I am. But when we had the Queen Elizabeth competition, there was a year. I, I was still in Amsterdam where Josse Nimesil was there in the jury, and also I think Rian de Waal as a pianist. I mean, both great musicians. Um, and, and the third volume of Czerny was just published, republished in uh, in German with an introduction. I think from um the name escapes me uh, and they also had the for the, the the part in the for the fourth edition fourth part uh, the a, a part of the fourth part where Czerny talks about beethoven sonatas and beethoven works in general they also had that i left out the the, the rest of the fourth edition it's strange actually they should have just republished the entirety of the forte piano school but they didn't do that but when Nimesel mentioned that on um on on belgian national television like this is quite important what this guy does is mentioned also by Czerny. it was one of the first times but it's very rare it's very rare that Czerny is mentioned by by hip people or by by musicians as a real source and a part of that is because he was destroyed so 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 much in the 20th century not in the 19th century by the way okay guys long rant um but be careful going back to the 19th century uh, it's not that you can nitpick, you know, this sort of like, this sort of like. Jenny would completely disregard because he was an idiot. By the way, really final point, I'll come back to that more extensively. It's not a trick that's only used by Mr. Kolodin. It's also used by someone like Andra Schiff. We, can, we, will, we will deconstruct also his lectures at Witchmore Hall Hall because they deserve to be really taken apart uh, because what Schiff 
says there is just it's made up it's made up i have no other words for that um he had to find a solution for these damn metronome marks before he went on stage and gave the lectures on beethoven sonatas what would be his response when someone said yeah what do you think of Met Moshe's and Czerny metronome marks so he destroyed Czerny by saying yeah we can disregard all of the metronome marks by Czerny i'm just quoting from memory because who likes the composer anyway of course laughter from the whole for what reason one has nothing to do with the other, as if Czerny lacked musical taste. But the result was that he got rid of him. I mean, nobody asked questions anymore. For Dharma Clavieri, had a very special solution. But I'll come back to that. I think we need to, to clarify also, or in other words, when people want to find, or when people feel, when they don't have any room for deflection anymore, because that it is, the people have, are going on stage as truth seekers, you know, and really go there in the case of Schiff, I mean, I'm digressing completely now, to give lectures around something. And again, in this time, in this time, it's not easy anymore to escape the matter of metronome marks. And I tap myself on the shoulder a little bit here, but I think our work has to do something with that. It's not possible anymore. People cannot say, oh, metronome marks, who, I mean, come on, who, who takes that serious? Nobody. We can discuss for, no, we cannot discuss on metronome marks. The metronome is just, metronome mark is just a ticking reference, so many ticks per minute. But when Schiff goes on stage, of course, he needs to give an answer, and he, this answer was just get rid of them at all. And so no questions asked anymore. We will ask those questions. But that's, uh, that's maybe partly also because why I made the segment on, on uh, the half-naked Lewis Colladin. I mean, come on, who is who is who, is, who has an avatar like that? Uh, or, or I think the name is avatar, right? A picture where you want, if you want to take be taken seriously. Anyways, that was it for today. If you're still here, I suppose you are subscribed to the channel but if you haven't go and do that hit the bell and also visit our patreon page i have to update those that if you watch this some days in the future i will probably have done that but we have an interesting community people who are getting together ask questions monthly hangouts um information there direct contact to me if you want and appreciate if you just check that out that was it for today guys thanks for watching see you soon again